Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, peace be upon all of you. Um, thank you so much for those who have organized this and invited us. I know that a lot of people are trying to sit down, uh, but my name is Saida Abdi. I am from Children's Hospital in Boston, and I'm part of the Boston Work Group. Uh, we are going to show a short video that shows our work in Boston before we start the panel. Thank you so much. I think reducing recruitment to violent extremist groups is one of the most complicated endeavors we could possibly engage in. My own cousin, uh, who lived in Europe, uh, we came to find out, joined ISIS. They managed to recruit him, and he's in their territory, wherever they are. We don't know whether he's alive or dead. I am a Somali mother who are raising children in Boston. My kids were born in Boston. And um, there is a lot of fear in the Somali community. We don't want what happened to other where in the United States happened to Boston. We don't want our children joining Al-Shabaab. We don't want them joining any other groups like ISIS. The problem we're trying to address is extraordinarily complicated because it, it is local, it's national, and it's international. It is very complicated. I, if you forget about everything else, the fact we are talking about law enforcement and communities working together, that's very complex. What makes things even more complicated, of course, is the fact that we're, we're still scrambling to figure out not only what are the kinds of things that should be involved in countering violent extremism, but more particularly, whose responsibility it actually is. Let's say if I am a new American, 16 years old, Somali, uh, male or female, it doesn't matter, living in Boston, attending one of the Boston public schools. My classmates have been in class for, since they were in kindergarten, but school was not an option for me in my motherland. What is the first thing I would feel in that classroom? I would be isolated, I would be alienated, I would frustrate, I can't keep up with the classwork. I, I don't know how to speak fluent. English like my classmates do. I cannot pronounce the way they pronounce. So what, what would I do as a 16-year-old new American? I would automatically feel like this environment, I don't belong to this environment. So what am I going to do? I'm going to find an environment that I belong to. A nice place to turn is a place with other people who feel that they've, they themselves have been wronged or marginalized. Trauma is, uh, is a fact that with my work with youth and our research actually, we found that trauma makes youth more vulnerable to all kinds of bad outcomes. They don't really understand that this is really a risky business, that folks who are on the other side of where they're going uh, are dead serious about getting them engaged in lethal activities. The groups of people who are the most vulnerable to recruitment, the groups of people who are the most vulnerable to becoming radicalized, are not from one particular community. They are not from one segment of society. They are from a cross-section. If you listen to people who will tell you that there is a specific profiling of an individual, you make a grand mistake. It's the students who try to connect, who want to connect, and don't connect, that are the most vulnerable. I think one of the obstacles to building effective CVE programming over recent years has been, has been lack of trust, and I completely understand why that might be the case. There is a huge fear that this is going to stigmatize the community, but more importantly, it's going to stigmatize youth who right now may already feel alienated and lost, and now are going to feel, well, is everyone going to look at me like I'm a terrorist? The biggest difficulty that we face is finding the middle ground in between uh, the community and uh, government. We are competing with people who have the resources, billions of dollars to convince our kids to provide them a better opportunity. Uh, we don't talk about this enough. When we talk about prevention, we're talking at different levels of prevention. And so are we talking about the kid who is on, getting on an airplane or are we talking about how do we uh, work with the younger kids so that they don't become vulnerable? There's no silver bullet. What works today may not necessarily be what works tomorrow. With the right amount of enthusiasm, it is something possible to accomplish.
It's all about the local context. It's about finding out what is driving the problem in your own backyard and working with your own local partners to figure out what the most appropriate solution and intervention might actually look like. As the U.S. Attorney, I've been tasked with really marshalling the efforts uh, of this pilot program. It's a true partnership uh, about building trust. I've been a part of experiences where law enforcement has come together with religious groups. You know, the government has a role. It can support the institutions run and function, but it is the people who take upon themselves to make a difference. The approach has to be inclusive. We don't want to take an exclusive approach because it will backfire. When we talk about prevention and intervention services, we take away some of the stigma. On prevention side, thinking about putting in place, for example, in schools and in communities, uh, support for youth who have gone through tra trauma, who may have PTSD, would be a wonderful way to stop this. Community have to be empowered to lead this initiative, because if a mother is in trouble, she feels comfortable co to connect with me. I would challenge those pastors to come out of the four walls of their sanctuaries and meet the youth where they were. And when someone goes to their place of worship, they want to feel like that they have the opportunity to debate with friends, talk about issues that are on their mind, vent even a little bit, and not be worried that they're being constantly monitored or there's some surveillance going on or there'll be some reporting of, uh, of whatever ideas they bring into that safe space. I think we need to do a far better job of inoculating our children from the kinds of messages and narratives that are being pushed out there by extremists in the organizations from which they come. The more that we can help children when they're younger and help families support those students, the more likely, likely we are to have success. Uh, youth are embedded in communities, they are born into it, they are raised, community has access to youth that no one else does. Uh, so I think they are our greatest gatekeepers in reality, both to getting to the youth, teaching the youth what to do the right thing, but they are also our greatest resource for prevention. And so I think that this involvement of the community is very important and I hope it works. Our goal is really to empower the community to do the work that it needs to do and really to help us to promote public safety. Thank you. You just saw uh, the video, uh, which essentially is a snapshot of our approach to this issue and to this work. Now I would like to introduce and call to the podium our U.S. Attorney Carmen Ortiz, who led this project in a way that is both sensitive and is very um, inclusive. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm U.S. Attorney Carmen Ortiz, as you heard, and it is a real honor to be here. Given Boston's history of successful collaborative approaches to combating violence, we were thrilled to be chosen to be one of the three pilot cities to develop and to implement a framework to counter violent extremism. The endeavor would not have been possible without the support of dozens of what I like to refer to as local champions, some of which you saw in the video, some of who are sitting here, and many who are back home in Boston. Local champions who consist of community activists, service providers, faith-based leaders, and educators who have been committed to this process. The framework that we have developed really is the first step and it is what we refer to as a menu of options to help communities, communities anywhere, regardless of their ethnicity, their issues, their problems, really to use and identify their own problems relative to them, whether it's dealing with vulnerable youth, whether it's dealing with distrust in the government, whether it's dealing with um, vulnerabilities to social media, but to identify those problems and really to help and to and, and to steer and to try to, to identify those individuals who are on the path uh, to violent extremism. And allow me to introduce the key collaborators um, that are sitting at the table that you'll be hearing, hearing from in a moment. D Dr. Nabil Kudari 
from the Islamic Council of New England, Imam Bashir Bilal from the Islamic Society of Greater Lowell, Robert Treston, Regional Director of the Anti-Defamation League, Jody Elgie, who's a Director for Counseling and Intervention from the Boston Public Schools, Diko Jabril, who's the Founder and Executive Director of the Somali Community Cultural Association, and as you heard earlier from Saida Abdi, who's been working with us closely. In starting this process, the challenge really was to try to be and bring a group as diverse as possible to really inform this, um, the, the strategic plan that we have come up with. And so I'll start first, you know, during this time frame, and it's going to be short, I know we are limited for time, we hope to cover the process that we engaged in in developing it, some of the problem areas that we identified, and a number of goals going forward. So let me start with Saida. Um, Saida, can you, from the onset of this initiative, we have talked about the importance of using a multidisciplinary approach to countering violent extremism, which requires a proper balance between non-governmental and governmental stakeholders. Can you share your impressions with the, the work that's been occurring thus far? Thank you. I think that um, I have been working with Somali youth for 20 years. Um, I am engaged right now at Children's Hospital in both research and intervention. And when I heard about this program, uh, my first thing was, oh my God, we are already traumatized by the talk about ISIS. Our kids see this on TV all day. Uh, others talk about it and how are we going to uh, do this. I was happy as a community member to be part of something that was actually going to work within the community, but how are we going to make sure it's inclusive, that it does not stigmatize, label, uh, uh, sort of uh, ostracize a community. And our, the approach post Boston too was, number one, that this was actually an issue that was too complex for it to be contained within a small group that we have to bring all these different expertise, but also that we, we have to be aware of this complexity. We have to invite all kinds of voices okay, into that discussion. We have to hear all of them. And the other thing was that we didn't have to label one community. Because you know what? At the start of all of this is how do we protect the vulnerable youth? Okay? And the fact that we have someone like Reverend Brown who has worked on gang issues in Boston and has worked dealt with how do we work with communities to prevent youth from being recruited into gangs and people, the imams. So we said we will have a, a, an approach that says this is not about Islam, it is not about Muslims, it's not a Muslim problem, it's a Boston problem, it's a US problem, it's a world problem. Islam is not the issue or the problem, it's not the violence, Islam though can be the resource that helped us counter the violence. And so that framework helped a lot. My, that framework was not only based on our feelings as community members, but in my own research with youth, we, did, uh, we talked to over 500 Somali youth um, across four sta three states and Canada. And one of the things we found was youth that felt that they were marginalized were more likely to endorse violence. And so this is actually, we cannot, you, uh, Albert Einstein said that we cannot try to solve our problems, paraphrasing here, by using the same thinking that got us into them first. And we cannot hate ourselves out of this. We cannot blame other, each other out of this. We can relate to each other. And this is by building relationship inclusiveness, that is the approach we are taking that will allow us to build a strong community. Thank you. Thank you. You know, in developing the framework, one of the challenges that we also had is that we have a variety of different communities um, within Boston, and it's not, you know, the three pilot cities each have different issues, and in many ways that's the beauty of having three varied um, cities. But in terms of empowering the community to really help and to really do the work that it needs to do to prevent radicalization that moves on to violent extremism, um, there's no question about the relationship um, involving youth, obviously, and the schools. So I, I'd like to turn to you, uh, Ms. Elgy. Given your experience in counseling and intervention efforts in the Boston public school system, can you tell us how under this pilot initiative we can work within existing school systems to engage people, especially youth, who may be vulnerable to recruitment? Sure, thank you. 
Carmen, and I want to say it's an honor and a privilege to be here and to be representing the Boston Public Schools. So the Boston Public Schools Counseling and Intervention Center provides five to ten, ten days of intensive counseling, assessment, and intervention and decision-making curriculum to students who have violated the code of conduct. We provide those services to more than 1,200 students a year. This alternative to suspension serves to keep kids in school and engaged rather than out on the street where we know that they're more likely to have trouble. Most of these disaffected youth have experienced trauma, violence at home or in the community, social exclusion, bullying, and most have, have been impacted by poverty. Even more, they have been unsuccessful at connecting with a caring adult in school, at home, or in the community. While, while the idea of countering violent extremism is new to the schools, the work necessary to identify and intervene is parallel to the work long being done in addressing street gangs. Both street gangs and violent extremists lure the most vulnerable in with promises of a better life with a purpose and a place to belong. We see that the most vulnerable and easily manipulated are those who, despite numerous, numerous attempts from an early age to engage, have not been successful. These failed joiners, and you may have heard the, that term in talking about bullying prevention and intervention as well, it is the failed joiners that we are most concerned about who feel angry, disrespected, and humiliated and are most likely to commit further acts of violence. Boston Public Schools has a long history of providing trauma-informed student support services to all students with, with school-wide counseling, social-emotional skill building, bullying prevention and intervention, and behavioral in interventions in lieu of suspension. These universal supports, and the emphasis is universal, are normalized for students, decreasing the stigma of use and access to those, to those services. In fact, when a, student, when a counselor goes to a classroom and asks to see a student, the question is not, where is that student going? The question from the peers is often, am I going to get to see a counselor? So it has become such normalized in the, in the, the, the actual fiber of the Boston Public Schools itself. Preventing and intervening in the cycle of violence requires early engagement with families and caregivers. <coughs> The development of relationships and trust to connect with schools takes time. By providing culturally relevant opportunities for families and caregivers through currently existing forums. So we don't have to recreate the wheel here. We just have to use the forums that are, that are currently in place. Parent universities, welcome centers, school site councils, and school and district-wide family events increase the likelihood of families reaching out for support. Community partnerships with schools, law enforcement, crisis services, and child welfare services build the very foundation of this work. Most significant is our partnership with the Boston Police Department and their Threat Assessment Unit and Operation Homefront Unit. They are their combination of police social workers as well as clergy going into homes and supporting families and students who are most at risk. Parents have actually reported great appreciation for these programs and those who were most reluctant to have the pastors and the police come into their home, once they're there, they, they talk for hours and sometimes call back and ask for interventions for their other students. So they really see it as a support service rather than a police action, and that, that is the intention. Normalizing the involvement of these partners before punitive measures are taken builds, helps to build positive relationships and trust within the community. Finally, this work takes resources and commitment from districts and municipalities. However, 
in this area of measuring success and accountability through testing, support services are often the first to be cut. This leaves a gaping hole for the most vulnerable students to be manipulated by those seeking to recruit them to do harm. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Elgin. I, I'm going to move it along. Be, um, we are really um, limited with time. So, Mr. Treston, given the role, you're, we're focusing on social media. That's another, obviously, and there's been a lot already said about that today. So if you could just briefly um, comment in terms of, uh, with respect to the pilot initiative, can you talk about the goals and solutions that we've considered as part of our pilot program? One of the things that the Boston group identified was uh, as a problem area was social media. And it's something that everyone in every community has access to. And we also saw social media as part of the solution, part of the, part of the work that we, knew, we need to work on when we, when we go back home. And that's because, as we've uh, talked about a little bit today, that as technology has changed uh, almost ev on a daily basis, uh, extremists are using it to uh, recruit and to justify uh, the sa and sanction violence. Um, and it's making it more accessible and more practical uh, to get for everyone. And one of the fundamental elements of uh, extremist propaganda is anti-Semitism, which is often packaged with explicit calls for violence uh, against Jewish targets, uh, but also against uh, law enforcement, also against democratic ideals. There are certain common themes that we see in the recruitment, in the use of, of social media. And these are used to uh, recruit essentially a cadre of would-be extremists, whether it be in the United States or in other parts of the world. Uh, the days of face-to-face -face interaction uh, are, are, are no longer a requirement for recruiting people. And so we identified this as, a, as an area to focus on and we also concluded that communities needed to be educated about ways to protect people from being recruited. And that this called for the, uh, essentially a diverse counter narrative um, that had a very broad and far reaching uh, impact. And as you've heard from, from uh, everyone on our panel, we didn't think that it actually impacted one particular community. We viewed it as impacting the entire community. And uh, those of us in Boston are, are, are no stranger to, to the impact that this, that this can have. And the focus really has been on strategies to deconstruct the extremist narrative by using communication platforms and to disseminate a new counter-narrative. And we have to make that counter-narrative as attractive and as appealing as the call is to commit violence in the first place. So the challenge on us is very, very high. And Boston's political community and religious leaders have to work together. It's an inclusive, working together process to curb those harmful consequences of the spread of hateful rhetoric and ideologies. And I think for those of us who worked on this from Boston, the real work is going to be when we go home. Because we're all committed to now implementing and working, uh, working together to make this change happen. Thank you. Um, we are literally have to, to end the panel. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Um, so I... Um, 30 seconds. Go with it. <laughs> Go ahead. Close it up. Um, 30 seconds? Okay. All right. Um, thank you for the honor of being here. On behalf of the Islamic Council of New England, which is representing over two dozen mosques, in 2013, a few months after the Boston Marathon bombing, our council responded to the need for community involvement and intervention prevent possible future detrimental action from misguided youth. Our council made a commitment to learn about the radicalization process and understand the influencers and create programs to stop recruitment from happening. Uh, one such program is built around early, uh, early education, and that's especially important to me as a father of a teenage son, which I'll discuss in a moment. But first, if we look at the data, we realize that uh, we don't see com compelling metrics. The FBI says that in less than five year, sorry, in five year period, less than 6% of uh, the terrorism domestically was perpetrated by Muslims. And in 2011, Pew Research Center said that there were no signs of growth or alienation uh, for Muslims supporting extremism. However, we know that there is an expansion of extremism, and the recruits are always looking for kids, and their ideology impacts uh, people in this country as well as countries around the world. And in um, New England, we have uh, kids that are uh, always vulnerable to the seductive techniques of the extremists. 
So just to get to the, the gist of what we do, um, we are developing a, um, a model of youth education. It's a workshop that's uh, implementing four ideas. Uh, a faith-based approach that encourages rational problem-solving skills in the face of adversity and intimidation found in anti-bullying programs, exposing the tools that extremists use online and offline to prey upon the youth. Uh, we give kids uh, a safe help option to um, feel that they can get help when they're vulnerable, and we give parents tools to deal with uh, and understand all aspects of this issue. This program is meant to be shared with uh, the imams and the school teachers and the uh, youth directors of our schools and facilities. Uh, we're going to create person-to-person -person workshops. Uh, we're going to have role playing to encourage the youth to feel empowered using nonviolent strategies if their religious sensibilities are challenged. There's a flow chart of reasoning that we want them to follow so that they can make the best choices to act on. And we want them to, of course, follow good Muslim role models, which in our case is our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, how would he would react to different challenges. So this has been described as a fusion between a DARE program and a what would Prophet Muhammad do role model approach. We include anger management. We review and practice these techniques, encouraging self-discipline and self-control. We're designing components that uh, deal with identifying a friend or a peer who might be at risk and ways to get them referred for help like suicide prevention guidelines. We're also incorporating the history of Islam in America using secular role models and respected advocates of nonviolence and we ought to want to emphasize diversity of all kinds of which we are part. We're not trying to recreate the wheel, but we want to create a wheel that we can take to new roads that have been inaccessible so far. So far the hope is that we can create an, an online version of this once we've refined it and share it with Muslims around the country and around the world. And as a father, I never want to see any parent deal with what has happened with folks who have lost their kids to violent extremism. In conclusion, Islam is not to blame for the threat of violent extremism luring our youth, but it can be and it will be a solution for helping them become spiritually educated and morally strong to resist the impulse of violence. When I was touring Washington, D.C. earlier today with my son, and yesterday too, it was uh, apparent that the values of our f founding fathers were just like the values of my father and his father before him. <laughs> and it was a reminder that Islamic values are shared with American values. And as we have become a community that is Boston strong, we're going to work as Muslims with our fellow citizens to become America strong. As on behalf of the Islamic Center and the uh, Islamic Council of New England, I thank you very much for supporting thank our work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you to all of our panels from Boston, from Minnesota, from Los Angeles. We have about 23 minutes left before we have to get prepared for our keynote speaker. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the final presentation, Partners in CVE, Jared Cohen from Google Ideas, Michael Davidson from Gen Next Foundation, and Mrs. Saja, Ms. Sasha Havlicek from the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. Come on up, guys. Thank you so much. I, I guess uh, differently than Oscar music, I'm told that in about 23 minutes, we're going to have presidential setup. Uh, so that will be, uh, will be slightly abridged. Uh, the focus of, of this session is to highlight a partnership between Google Ideas, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, and the Jack Next Foundation on using technology to counter violent extremism online and offline. But before we do that, I want to say a little bit about why Google Ideas is tackling the challenge of violent extremism as a supplement to the excellent work that you heard from my colleague, Victoria Grant. Uh, about four and a half years ago, uh, Eric Schmidt and I stood up Google Ideas based on this assumption that we wanted the company to be proactive about the intersection of technology and some of the most complicated, difficult global security challenges. And we wanted to build an engineering and product team that could also create tools that could be used to address them. And it's interesting, you hear government talk a lot about needing to organize around challenges like violent extremism. It's the same in the private sector. Google Ideas falls in sort of a unique place within a corporate environment in the sense that the challenges we focus on from repressive societies to illicit networks to violent extremism don't fall in an obvious core business box or an obvious uh, uh, corporate social responsibility slash philanthropy box. They occupy a new space uh, around international security uh, and business. And when we started, really the first challenge that we started to focus on was, was violent extremism. And just as we would in a product organization, we began with our uh, convening power to try to break down the problem in a way that was sufficiently concrete for our engineers to try and troubleshoot. 
So we convened a summit against violent extremism in June of 2011, where we brought together about 100 former violent religious extremists, uh, former violent far-right extremists, former gang members, and former violent nationalists, literally from dozens of countries. We also brought together survivors, technologists, NGOs, and public policy leaders. And what we were struck by is how similar the radicalization process was across each of these different contexts and how much they hated being compared to each other uh, because it, it took away from each of them what they thought was exceptional and remarkable about themselves and broke it down as these are violent organizations that basically exploit children. And when we remove the mass of religion and ideology that these violent extremists cultivate, what we were found with is there's a dangerous and exaggerated sense that the root cause of all this is religion. And you heard my colleague Victoria Grand say earlier that really what we found is they're offering young people a sense of empowerment, an outlet for adventure, enhanced status, and a group to belong to. And so in many cases, they're really starting as broken souls who eventually get access to some pretty dangerous tools. And that's really the problem that we're, we're confronted. And then the second observation we came away with from this before I turn it over to Sasha and Michael is around technology. You know, it's so easy to use technology as a lightning rod. But in actuality, what we found from our research with formers and others is that more connectivity is not fueling radicalization, it's quite the opposite. You know, if you go back to the not so distant past, um, there used to be a veil of secrecy around the radicalization process. It would happen in caves, in places completely off the grid, and there weren't the opportunities that we have for intervention today. Now, terrorists have been practicing their physical tactics for the last 1,500, 2,000 years. Their digital tactics are much newer, much less seasoned, and we have much more expertise than they do. And so this is pointed to us as a huge vulnerability. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Sasha and Michael, who are going to talk about a remarkable action network that came out of the Summit Against Violent Extremism, which focuses on taking advantage of one of the best assets we have, uh, which is the fact that violent extremists are vastly outnumbered by those who oppose it. And that's even more the case online. So I'm pleased to introduce you to Sasha Havelcheck, who's the CEO of the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. Sasha, over to you. Jared, thank you so much. And I'm honored. I know we have to do this in fast forward. So very quickly, um, we're delighted and we're excited to, to share with you some of the tools that we've developed to counter extremism across ideologies with you. I should just start by saying that as a think tank that's worked to counter extremisms of all forms over the last 10 years, the most innovative and the most effective work that we've done to date has been as a result of these kinds of private sector partnerships, perhaps unsurprisingly. We need more of them. So just a couple of words about the problem before, um, before we, we, we get started. I'll let you take a look at this quote. Anybody recognize it? So interestingly, this is a statement made as far back as 2002 by Osama bin Laden. And what it says is that long before ISIS, extremist groups have understood the strength of soft power. And they were extremely quick to understand the opportunities in this regard that the digital era presents. They understand how to hypercharge their messaging. They've got a head start on us. Now, we all know very well that ISIS could give masterclasses in branding and peer-to-peer -peer social media marketing. They've even created their own Twitter amplification apps. We heard about those earlier. But the real problem here in our, in our eyes is the monumental gap that we've allowed to transpire between their tech savvy, 24 seven, strategic propaganda machinery on the one hand and our counter efforts on the other. That little guy there, that's us with the old fashioned megaphone. We did some research for the Canadian government that uncovered just how big that gap is. Our response has essentially amounted to a handful, handfuls maybe, of small-scale, unconnected, unsustained, unprofessionalized counter-narratives. We're being outdone both in terms of content, quantity, and quality, and in terms of amplification strategies. The problem is that governments are ill-placed to lead in the battle of ideas. Credible voices and activists, many of whom are here, have in general lacked the skills and the infrastructure to, to reach the target audiences that they need to be reaching. Capabilities, of course, that our private sectors possess in vast quantities that they're using to sell us stuff, but at this point still not at scale to help us with this counter-messaging challenge, the communications challenge of our time. And so they've had a head start. We've had no serious competition strategy to date. And so we started to ask ourselves if ISIS has a branding 
and marketing department, where is ours? And so ISD has turned itself into an experiment. To steal back from the terrorists their most successful tactics, to get the private sector on board, and to innovate and trial as many responses as possible, each tailored to a specific audience, just as they do it, from upstream to downstream. So in the first place, we looked at the content gap. There's been a lot of focus on taking stuff down, but we know that that on its own has limited impact. Instead, we started to look at what competition would look like, and we turned to our AVE network of formers and survivors, perhaps some of the most qualified and credible voices in this space, and we asked them for ideas. And let me introduce you to Abdullah X, created by one of our AVE members. No, he's not working, I'm gonna move on. Is our video not, go back, go back, go back. Oh, the technology fails us. This is proving our point. Never mind. Let me tell you, let me tell you what we've learned from Abdullah X. The video you can find on YouTube, he has his own channel, so I, I direct you there. So what we've learned. Credible content is absolutely crucial, but on its own, it doesn't do the job. Uh, without the support that we were able to give with our combined partnerships, Abdullah X was reaching about 50 random people online. As part of a pilot that we did um, with a, an EU working group that we co-chair with Google Ideas, we were able to hypercharge that counter-narrative. And what that meant was inserting Abdullah X into the very spaces extremists were using, just as they have started to occupy the spaces that we hang out in. It meant anchoring this extremist, this content to extremist Twitter accounts, posting it on extremist pages, having it pop up whenever you searched for jihad in Syria. And within just a few months, this went from reaching just those 50 random people to 100,000 of our target group, and that is individuals searching to go to Syria for jihad. And so we now know what can work because we can measure the engagement that Abdullah X has had with our target group online. We have that data. And of course, in a way, perhaps the best, um, the, the best indicator of Abdullah X's success was the five-page refutation that had incited an urgent refutation at that from ISIS. So what we've learned most importantly, I think, is that this isn't about vanity metrics. This is not, in fact, about going viral. We don't need to reach a, a million of you. We need to reach thousands, perhaps, of the individuals really at risk and being radicalized. And what we're really doing is turning ourselves into an innovation lab where we can provide the production, marketing, targeting, data analytics, and campaigns input necessary to credible voices who own that content themselves but require that support. And in 2015, with the combined support of Google, now Facebook, and Twitter as well, we're going to be supporting 35 such campaigns. We need hundreds. And that's, I hope, what we'll be able to do with growing support in this space. Here's another example of some of the stuff that's coming out of this innovation lab of ours. Pioneering one-to-one -one intervention work. This is a pilot that we've conducted on Facebook, and it's about taking online what we do with formers offline and what we know really works effectively to walk people back from the edge. Right now, there's only extremists and intel services really engaging with this constituency online. We were wondering, will this incite maybe a 1% response? Will those people that we reach out to be aggressive largely? Probably. Well, in actual fact, we had a 35% positive response rate. And, and I think that's a testament to reaching out with credible voices. These are former extremists talking to these kids in these fora. And in terms of reach, and outreach can be automated automated so that we can reach more and poor, more people in this way. But the big question, how do we get ahead of the curve? How do we start to inoculate young people before they get pulled into these extremist ideologies and movements? This is the aim of Extreme Dialogue. It's an amazing new tool we're launching this week. In fact, we launched yesterday in Canada. This is Chris. Her son died in Syria, fighting with ISIS. Her absolutely heartbreaking story, and I, I would challenge anybody here to watch the film that we've made with creative partners. You can find it on, Extreme, uh, on the Extreme Dialogue website. 
to watch it without weeping and then wondering whether perhaps your own children could end up with such a fate. These kinds of films, of Chris, but also of, of other individuals in our network, including Daniel Gallant, a former neo-Nazi, constitute part of an educational resource that combines these kinds of workers to use interactively with kids in classrooms, in community centers, around the world, we hope. And what we're trying really to do is to take these kinds of stories into every school and community center possible. To start to get those hard conversations going, to start to get kids questioning and thinking critically about these kinds of issues, to mainstream that discussion in a sensitive way. What working with the private sector means in this particular context is that instead of taking Chris and Daniel Gallant into perhaps one school a day, we're able to beam them into hundreds of thousands of schools every day. And that kind of scale is what we really need with the scale of the challenge that we're dealing with. Since yesterday, just to give you a sense, Chris's video has reached over 20,000 people online. That's just in one day. It gives you a sense of the thirst for this kind of content. So in conclusion, I would just say that we, as part of turning ourselves into this innovation lab, at the heart of which are the private partnerships that we've developed here, are trying to bridge the massive soft power gap that we've allowed to emerge, both online and offline. We now have the data to prove that these approaches work. We have proof of concept, but what's been done so far is really a drop in the ocean. Help us grow the soft power machinery that we have started to build, matching expertise and credible voices with the, the private sector capabilities and resources that we really need so that we can undermine, delegitimize, disrupt, and compete seriously with the machinery the extremists have deployed so successfully and nearly unchallenged so far. So the partnerships here that we've been lucky enough to develop with Google Ideas, with YouTube, with the Gen Next Foundation, and now we're delighted with Harvard, with, the face, with Facebook, with Twitter, and we hope with many more, have allowed us so far to scale our work perhaps by 300 times. We need that to be scaled 300-fold, 3,000-fold, 300,000-fold. And we hope that you will help us do that. Do we have the stomach? Do we have the will to kick this into mass production? That is a question I will let uh, my friend and colleague Michael Davidson answer. Um, one of a kind, Gen Next is doing extraordinary work to get the private sector involved in these important and problematic issues. Thank you. All right, thank you uh, for the sort of private sector philanthropy guy. It's pretty cool to be at the White House talking about this type of an issue. Uh, and it's incredible to work with these two. Um, and just to be in a room with all of you gives me quite a bit, a bit of a burst of energy. Uh, I want, though, to direct my comments to anybody from the private sector or philanthropy sector uh, that is in the room uh, that will be happen to be watching C-SPAN or television, uh, or who you know, and hopefully you could relay this message to them. Uh, our organization, the Gen X Foundation, uses a venture philanthropy model to basically do two things. We look for very long-term, lasting impact ideas, and we put them in the hands of business and thought leaders to make them a reality. Now, why do I, am I, why am I attracted to this type of a calling? Uh, one is I really believe that ideas have consequences. Uh, number two is I really like people. Uh, but number three, and most importantly, is I really love my kids. I have uh, two twin girls that are almost uh, five months old. Yeah, crazy. And I also have a son who's five years old. And when I think about sort of my life's ethos, there's a quote that I love, and it's, when it comes to the future, there are three types of people. There's those who let it happen, there are those who wonder what happened, and there's those who make it happen. Um, and that sounds really good, and I tend to think of those moments when I think of that issue when I'm, when I'm watching my daughters roll over for the first time, or I'm watching both of them look at me, and I think about what their future is going to be and what what role am I create, playing in creating it? Uh, and I also think about it when my son asks me repeatedly what it's like to be Superman. Now, I may or may not have helped 
him disclose my natural and real identity as Superman. Um, but when he asked me about that, I then will usually, uh, it's in the mornings when I get to spend that time with them, and then I start to think about, I start to read the news shortly afterward, and I read about beheadings, and I read about crucifixions, and I read about uh, crazies taking over a school and killing children, and suddenly I don't really like being Superman. It's, you feel helpless, you feel hopeless, uh, it's confusing, and often it's natural to be very afraid. This enemy is resilient, they're driven, they're agile, and they happen to be using tools that we as a free society created. So when you think about the response, you need people in the free society who are resilient and agile and driven to take them on. There is a real opportunity for entrepreneurs and philanthropists to lead the way on this issue. Uh, philanthropists need to find a way to put money at work in a very long-term focus. And it's unnatural in the philanthropy sector. They also need to find a way to take risks. Because when you're dealing with CVE, there's a lot of risk. Uh, entrepreneurs you know, really need to think about their time, talent, and treasure uh, and dedicating this as a cause. It's not very natural to think about what you do to create jobs and what you do to make money is also something that you could do in countering violent extremism. And just as a couple examples, you would never expect a San Diego entrepreneur who has an online agency and does digital strategy to do for counter-extremism what he does for Nike. Or just here in the corner is Joe Marchese from New York. Uh, well, he's a man of the country, he's a man of the world, but he's from New York. Uh, but he has a business that will completely upend the way we look at advertising. He knows how to sell ideas, and he's here because he cares about selling ideas to save people's lives. We need more people like him. And we need more people like us to challenge them. It's, again, not natural for them to think about being part of this as a cause. Sometimes when I have those moments when I'm doubting myself as Superman and I'm reading the news and it's really frightening, I'll think to myself, I really hope the government can figure that out. I just want to elect the right person. And I think that matters. But we should all be completely and utterly engaged on this issue. And I believe if we are, and if we're successful with our work, my kids, your kids, our kids, are going to be reading about ISIS in the history books. They're not going to be dealing with an issue that we were unable to deal with. So if every single entrepreneur and every single philanthropist wakes up tomorrow morning and accepts that we, the greatest things that all of us at the end of the day cherish is our children's future, if we make that commitment tomorrow morning, then suddenly this is not going to be a problem that my kids, I'm not going to feel afraid as Superman, I'm actually feel very quite awesome. And going back to that quote about making the future happen, it's going to be just like living in a free society. Thank you. I believe the presidential Oscar music's about to, uh, about to happen, so I promised our colleagues at the White House that we would end on time, and I'm pleased to say we're ending on time to the minute. Thank you. Well done, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who appeared on our panels today. Um, we're gonna have to take a short break um, because we need to set up the stage for our keynote speaker. So I invite all of you to take about 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes to stretch, use the restrooms, et cetera. You need to be back in your seats no later than 4.05. If you're not in the room by then, we're gonna close the doors and we'll ask you to go up to 3.50. So um, please take that to heart. We really mean it this time. So. So as we move to closing remarks, we ask that you think about everything discussed in today's presentations, that you identify ways for each and every one of you to leave here as active innovators. If we all look for ways to engage with communities of religious, business, civic leaders, we'll help create an inclusive space where fewer and fewer people feel marginalized. It's my privilege to introduce Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, Ms. Lisa Monaco, who will provide the initial closing remarks and introduce our keynote speaker. Lisa. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, know that I am the only person standing between you and the main event, so I'll be very brief. I do want to thank everyone for being here today. 
uh, law enforcement officers, community leaders, teachers, elected officials, foreign ministers, and of course, entrepreneurs. Uh, thanks so much for taking part today and spending your time here in these discussions with us. This summit focuses on domestic and international efforts to prevent terrorist attacks, like those, of course, that we've seen most recently in Copenhagen, in Paris, Boston, and Sydney, and which sadly occur daily in places like Nigeria, Iraq, Syria, and beyond. Here in the US, though, thanks to the tireless efforts and sacrifices of our men and women in uniform, to our diplomats and intelligence personnel and law enforcement officers, since 9-11, our defenses have been hardened, plots have been disrupted, and alliances have been strengthened. But countering violent extremism in all its forms is not just an American problem, or a Western problem, it's of course an international problem. Every community touched by violence faces the same questions, whether it's Boston or Paris, Baghdad or Peshawar. How can we prevent people from embracing hateful ideologies before they turn to violence? How can we, we replace the dark worldview of extremists in the Muslim world or elsewhere with an alternate vision for a brighter future? How can we work together more effectively within our own governments, with international partners and local communities? This summit is a place where we're looking to find answers to those questions and to develop action plans that hold all of us accountable as we move forward. Before we hear from President Obama, allow me to just make two brief observations from the last day and a half of discussions. The first is, of course, that governments cannot meet this challenge alone. As you've heard from Vice President Biden and others, it's local communities, teachers, religious leaders, coaches, family, friends, those are the people who are best equipped to provide an alternate path before someone is radicalized to violence. While governments can help, ultimately the solutions will have to be rooted and found in local communities. The second point I want to emphasize is that countering violent extremism is a constantly evolving challenge. We've got to keep refining our approach so we can respond to new threats. We can't just rely on traditional tools when we're dealing with internet savvy terrorists who reach across oceans with the click of a mouse, extremists who exploit young people using Facebook and Twitter. We need to be creative, to think outside the box. We need to leverage our vast intellectual talents, our creativity, our innovative uh, efforts and spirit, our technical know-how to take on extremist bankrupt ideologies. I recently sat down with some of Silicon Valley's most creative and innovative minds, some of whom I'm very thankful have joined us today to discuss just this very challenge. Our conversation included tech entrepreneurs, content creators, authors, NGO leaders, all of whom have an important voice in countering extremist propaganda online. We discussed ways to apply integrated network solutions to drown out the hate of groups like Al Qaeda and ISIL. Because one antidote to the hatred spewed by extremists is to lift up the voices of freedom and tolerance. Today, we're seeing people step up to do their part. And looking ahead, I challenge tech and social media communities to expand these efforts, to give young people more opportunities to raise their voices above the noise of extremists. So there's plenty of work to do, and I hope the past two days have done as much to inspire you and to energize all of you as they have me. We are going to count on each one of you uh, for your good ideas and your leadership going forward. And now, I have the distinct honor of introducing someone who has been laser focused on making countering violent extremism a central part of our counterterrorism strategy from his very first days in office, including by developing the first government wide strategy to prevent violent extremism here at home. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the President of the United States, Barack Obama. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody, please have a seat. Well, thank you, Lisa, for the introduction. Uh, 
Lisa is an example of the countless dedicated public servants across our government, uh, a number of who are here today who are working tirelessly every single day on behalf of the security and safety of the American people. Uh, so we very much appreciate her. Uh, and thanks to all of you uh, for your attendance and participation in this important summit. For more than 238 years, the United States of America has not just endured, but we have thrived and surmounted challenges that might have broken a lesser nation. After a terrible civil war, we repaired our union. We weathered a Great Depression, became the world's most dynamic economy. We fought fascism, liberated Europe. We faced down communism and won. American communities have been destroyed by earthquakes and tornadoes and fires and floods, and each time we rebuilt. The bombing that killed 168 people could not break Oklahoma City. On 9-11, terrorists tried to bring us to our knees. Today, a new tower soars above New York City, and America continues to lead throughout the world. After Americans were killed at Fort Hood and the Boston Marathon, it didn't divide us. We came together as one American family. In the face of horrific acts of violence, at a Sikh temple near Milwaukee or at a Jewish community center outside Kansas City. We reaffirmed our commitment to pluralism and to freedom, repulsed by the notion that anyone should ever be targeted because of who they are or what they look like or how they worship. Most recently, with the brutal murders in Chapel Hill of three young Muslim Americans, many Muslim Americans are worried and afraid. And I want to be as clear as I can be. As Americans, all faiths and backgrounds, we stand with you in your grief, and we offer our love, and we offer our support. My point is this. As Americans, we are strong, and we are resilient. And when tragedy strikes, when we take a hit, we pull together, and we draw on what's best in our character. Our optimism, our commitment to each other, our commitment to our values, our respect for one another. We stand up and we rebuild and we recover and we emerge stronger than before. That's who we are. And, and I, I say all this because we face genuine challenges to our security today just as we have throughout our history. Challenges to our security are not new. They didn't happen yesterday or a week ago or a year ago. We've always faced challenges. One of those challenges is the terrorist threat from groups like Al Qaeda and ISIL. But this isn't our challenge alone. It's a challenge for the world. ISIL is terrorizing the people of Syria and Iraq, beheads and burns human beings on unfathomable acts of cruelty. We've seen deadly attacks in Ottawa and Sydney and Paris and now Copenhagen. And so in the face of this challenge, we have marshaled the full force of the United States government, and we're working with allies and partners to dismantle terrorist organizations and protect the American people. Given the complexities of the challenge and the nature of the enemy, which is not a traditional army, this work takes time and will require vigilance and resilience and perspective. But I'm confident that just as we have for more than two centuries, we will ultimately prevail. And part of what gives me that confidence is the overwhelming response of the world community to the savagery of these terrorists. Not just revulsion, but a concrete commitment to work together to vanquish these organizations. At the United Nations in September, I called on the international community to come together and eradicate this scourge of violent extremism. And I want to thank all of you
from across America and around the world for answering this call. Tomorrow, the State Department, governments, and civil society groups from more than 60 countries will focus on the steps that we can take as governments. And I'll also speak about how our nations have to remain relentless in our fight, our counterterrorism efforts against groups that are plotting against our countries. But we are here today because of a very specific challenge, and that's countering violent extremism, something that is not just a matter of military affairs. By violent extremism, we don't just mean the terrorists who are killing innocent people. We also mean the ideologies, the infrastructure of extremists, the propagandists, the recruiters, the funders who radicalize and recruit or incite people to violence. We all know there is no one profile of a violent extremist or terrorist. So there's no way to predict who will become radicalized. Around the world and here in the United States, inexcusable acts of violence have been committed against people of different faiths, by people of different faiths, which is, of course, a betrayal of all our faiths. It's not unique to one group or to one geography, or one period of time. But we are here at this summit because of the urgent threat from groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIL. And this week, we are focused on prevention, preventing these groups from radicalizing, recruiting, or inspiring others to violence in the first place. I've called upon governments to come to the United Nations this fall with concrete steps that we can take together. And today, uh, what I want to do is suggest several areas where I believe we can concentrate our efforts. First, we have to confront squarely and honestly the twisted ideologies that these terrorist groups use to incite people to violence. Now, leading up to this summit, there's been a fair amount of debate in the press and among pundits about the words we use to describe and frame this challenge. So I want to be very clear about how I see it. Al-Qaeda and ISIL and groups like it are desperate for legitimacy. They try to portray themselves as religious leaders, holy warriors in defense of Islam. That's why ISIL presumes to declare itself the Islamic State. And they propagate the notion that America and the West generally, is at war with Islam. That's how they recruit. That's how they try to radicalize young people. We must never accept the premise that they put forward, because it is a lie. Nor should we grant these terrorists the religious legitimacy that they seek. They are not religious leaders. They're terrorists. And we are not at war with Islam. Amen. We are at war with people who have perverted Islam. Now, just as those of us outside Muslim communities need to reject the terrorist narrative that the West and Islam are in conflict, or modern life and Islam are in conflict, I also believe that Muslim communities have a responsibility as well. Al-Qaeda and ISIL do draw selectively from the Islamic texts. They do depend upon the misperception around the world that they speak in some fashion for people of the Muslim faith, that Islam is somehow inherently violent, that there is some sort of clash of civilizations. <laughs> Of course, the terrorists do not speak for over a billion Muslims who reject their hateful ideology. They no more represent Islam than any madman who kills innocents in the name of God represents Christianity or Judaism or Buddhism or Hinduism. No religion is responsible for terrorism. People are responsible for violence and terrorism.
And to their credit, there are respected Muslim clerics and scholars, not just here in the United States, but around the world, who push back on this twisted interpretation of their faith. They want to make very clear what Islam stands for. And we're joined by some of those leaders today. These religious leaders and scholars preach that Islam calls for peace and for justice and tolerance towards others, that terrorism is prohibited, that the Quran says whoever kills an innocent, it is as if he has killed all mankind. Those are the voices that represent over a billion people around the world. But if we are going to effectively isolate terrorists, if we're going to address the challenge of their efforts to recruit our young people, if we're going to lift up the voices of tolerance and pluralism within the Muslim community, then we've got to acknowledge that their job is made harder by a broader narrative that it does exist in many Muslim communities around the world that suggests the West is at odds with Islam in some fashion. The reality, which again many Muslim leaders have spoken to, is, is that there's a strain of thought that doesn't embrace ISIL's tactics, doesn't embrace violence, but does buy into the notion that the Muslim world has suffered historic grievances. Sometimes that's accurate. Does buy into the belief that so many of the ills in the Middle East flow from a history of colonialism or conspiracy. Does buy into the idea that Islam is incompatible with modernity or tolerance, or that uh, it's been polluted by Western values. And so those beliefs exist. In some communities around the world, they are widespread. And so it makes individuals, especially young people who already may be disaffected or alienated, more ripe for radicalization. And so we've got to be able to talk honestly about those issues. We've got to be much more clear about how we're rejecting uh, certain ideas. So just as leaders like myself reject the notion that terrorists like ISIL genuinely represent Islam, Muslim leaders need to do more to discredit the notion that our nations are determined to suppress Islam, that there is an inherent clash in civilizations. Everybody has to speak up very clearly that no matter what the grievance, violence against innocence doesn't defend Islam or Muslims, it damages Islam and Muslims. And when all of us together are doing our part to reject the narratives of violent extremists, when all of us are doing our part to be very clear about the fact that there are certain universal precepts and values that need to be respected in this interconnected world, that's the beginnings of a partnership. As we go forward, we need to find new ways to amplify the voices of peace and tolerance and inclusion. And we especially need to do it online. We also need to lift up the voices of those who know the hypocrisy of groups like ISIL firsthand, including former extremists. Their words speak to us today. And, and I know in some of the discussions, these voices have been raised. I witnessed horrible crimes committed by ISIS. It's not a revolution or jihad, it's a slaughter. I was shocked by what I did. This isn't what we came for, to kill other Muslims. I'm 28. Is this the only future I'm able to imagine? That's the voice of so many who were temporarily radicalized and then saw the truth. And they've warned other young people not to make the same mistakes as they did. Do not run after illusions. Do not be deceived. Do not give up 
your life for nothing. We need to lift up those voices. And in all this work, the greatest resource are communities themselves, especially like those young people who are here today. We are joined by talented young men and women who are pioneering new innovations and new social media tools and new ways to reach young people. We're joined by leaders from the private sector, including high-tech companies who want to support your efforts. And I want to challenge all of us to build new partnerships that unleash the talents and creativity of young people, young Muslims, not just to expose the lives of extremists, but to empower youth to service and to lift up people's lives here in America and around the world. And that can be a calling for your generation. So that's the first challenge. We've got, to, we've got to discredit these ideologies. We have to tackle them head on. And we, we can't shy away from these discussions. And too often, folks are understandably sensitive about uh, addressing some of these root issues. But we have to talk about them, honestly and clearly. Because, and, and the reason I, I believe we have to do so is because I'm so confident that when the truth is out, we'll be successful. Now, the second challenge is we do have to address the grievances that terrorists exploit, including economic grievances. Poverty alone does not cause a person to become a terrorist any more than poverty alone causes somebody to become a criminal. There are millions of people, billions of people in the world who live in abject poverty and are focused on what they can do to build up their own lives and never embrace violent ideologies. Conversely, there are terrorists who come from extraordinarily wealthy backgrounds, like Osama bin Laden. What's true, though, is that when millions of people, especially youth, are impoverished and have no hope for the future, when corruption inflicts daily humiliations on people, when there are no outlets by which people can express their concerns, resentments fester. The risk of instability and extremism grow. Where young people have no education, they are more vulnerable to conspiracy theories and radical ideas, because it's not tested against anything else. They've got nothing to weigh. And we've seen this across the Middle East and North Africa. And terrorist groups are all too happy to step into a void. They offer salaries to their foot soldiers they can, so they can support their families. Sometimes they offer social services, schools, health clinics, to do what local governments cannot or will not do. They try to justify their violence in the name of fighting the injustice of corruption that steals from the people, even while those terrorist groups end up committing even worse abuses like kidnapping and human trafficking. So if we're going to prevent people from being susceptible to the false promises of extremism, then the international community has to offer something better. And the United States intends to do its part. We will keep promoting development and growth that is broadly shared so more people can provide for their families. We'll keep leading a global effort against corruption because the culture of the bribe has to be replaced by good governance that doesn't favor certain groups over others. Countries have to truly invest in the education and skills and job training that our extraordinary young people need. And by the way, that's boys and girls and, and men and women because countries will not be truly successful if half their populations, if their girls and their women, are denied opportunity. And America will continue to forge new partnerships in entrepreneurship and innovation and science and technology. So young people from Morocco to Malaysia can start new businesses and create more prosperity. Now, just as we address economic grievances, we need to face a third challenge, and that's addressing the political grievances that are exploited by terrorists. 
when governments oppress their people, deny human rights, stifle dissent, or marginalize ethnic and religious groups, or favor certain religious groups over others, it sows the seeds of extremism and violence. It makes those communities more vulnerable to recruitment. Terrorist groups claim that change can only come through violence. And if peaceful change is impossible, that plays into extremist propaganda. So the essential ingredient to real and lasting stability and progress is not less democracy, it's more democracy. It's institutions. It's institutions that uphold the rule of law and apply justice equally. It's security forces and police that respect human rights and treat people with dignity. It's free speech in strong civil societies where people can organize and assemble and advocate for peaceful change. It's freedom of religion, where all people can practice their faith without fear and intimidation. All of this is part of countering violent extremism. Fourth, we have to recognize that our best partners in all these efforts, the best people to help protect individuals from falling victim to extremist ideologies, are their own communities, their own family members. We have to be honest with ourselves. Terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIL deliberately target their propaganda in the hopes of reaching and brainwashing young Muslims, especially those who may be disillusioned or wrestling with their identity. That's the truth. The high-quality videos, the online magazines, the use of social media, terrorist Twitter accounts, it's all designed to target today's young people online in cyberspace. And by the way, uh, the older people here, as wise and respected as you may be, your stuff is often boring <laughs> compared to what they're doing. You're not, you're not connected. And as a consequence, you are not connecting. So these terrorists are a threat, first and foremost, to the communities that they target, which means Communities have to take the lead in protecting themselves. And that is true here in America as it's true anywhere else. When someone gets, starts getting radicalized, family and friends are often the first to see that something's changed in their personality. Teachers may notice a student becoming withdrawn or struggling with his or her identity. And if they intervene at that moment and offer support, that may make a difference. Faith leaders may notice that someone's beginning to espouse violent interpretations of religion. And that's a moment for possible intervention that, that allows them to think about their actions and reflect on the meaning of their faith in a way that's more consistent with, with peace and justice. Families and friends, coworkers, neighbors, faith leaders, they want to reach out. They want to help save their loved ones and friends and prevent them from taking a wrong turn. But communities don't always know the signs to look for or have the tools to intervene or know what works best. And that's where government can play a role if government is serving as a trusted partner. And that's where we also need to be honest. I know some Muslim Americans have concerns about working with government particularly law enforcement. And the reluctance is rooted in the objection to certain practices where Muslim Americans feel they've been unfairly targeted. So in our work, we have to make sure that abuses stop, are not repeated, that we do not stigmatize entire communities. Nobody should be profiled or put under a cloud of suspicion simply because of their faith. Engagement with communities can't be a cover for surveillance. We can't securitize our relationship with Muslim Americans, dealing with them solely through the prism of law enforcement. Because when we do, that only reinforces suspicions, makes it harder for us to build the trust that we need to work together. 
As part of this summit, we're announcing that we're going to increase our outreach to communities, including Muslim Americans. We're going to step up our efforts to engage with partners and raise awareness so more communities understand how to protect their loved ones from becoming radicalized. We've got to devote more resources to these efforts. Um, and, and as government does more, communities are going to have to step up as well. We need to build on the pilot pro programs that have been discussed at this summit already in, in Los Angeles and Minneapolis and Boston. These are partnerships that bring people together in a spirit of mutual respect and create more dialogue and more trust and more cooperation. If we're going to solve these issues, then the people who are most targeted and potentially most affected, Muslim Americans, have to have a seat at the table where they can help shape and strengthen these partnerships so that we're all working together to help communities stay safe and strong and resilient. And finally, uh, we need to do what extremists and terrorists hope we will not do, and that is stay true to the values that define us as free and diverse societies. If extremists are peddling the notion that Western countries are hostile to Muslims, then we need to show that we welcome people of all faiths. Here in America, Islam has been woven into the fabric of our country since its founding. Generations. <laughs> Generations of Muslim immigrants came here and went to work as farmers and merchants and factory workers, helped to lay railroads and, and, and build up America. The first Islamic center in New York City was founded in, in the 1890s. America's first mosque, this was an interesting fact, was in North Dakota. <laughs> Muslim Americans protect our communities as police officers and firefighters and first responders and protect our nation by serving in uniform and in our intelligence communities and in homeland security and in cemeteries across our country, including at Arlington. Muslim American heroes rest in peace, having given their lives in defense of all of us. And of course, that's the story extremists and terrorists don't want the world to know. Muslims succeeding and thriving in America. Because when that truth is known, it exposes their propaganda as the lie that it is. It's also a story that every American must never forget. Because it reminds us all that hatred and bigotry and pet prejudice have no place in our country. It's not just counterproductive. It doesn't just aid terrorists. It's wrong. It's contrary to who we are. I'm thinking of a little girl named Sabrina who last month sent me a Valentine's Day card in the shape of a heart. It was the first Valentine I got. <laughs> I got, got it from Sabrina before Malia and Sasha, <laughs> and Michelle gave me one. So she's 11, she's 11 years old. She's in the fifth grade. She's a young Muslim American. And she said in her Valentine, I enjoy being an American. And when she grows up, she wants to be an engineer or a basketball player, <laughs> which are, are good choices. But she wrote, uh, I am worried about people hating Muslims. If some Muslims do bad things, that doesn't mean all of them do. And she asked, please tell everyone that we are good people and we're just like everyone else. Now, Those are the words and the wisdom of a little girl growing up here in America, just like my daughters are growing up here in America. We're just like everybody else. And everybody needs to remember that during the course of this debate. As we move forward with these challenges. 
We all have responsibilities. We all have hard work ahead of us on this issue. We can't paper over problems. And we're not going to solve this if we're always just trying to be politically correct. But we do have to remember that 11-year-old girl. That's our hope. That's our future. That's how we discredit violent ideologies, by making sure her voice is lifted up, making sure she's nurtured, making sure that she's supported, and then recognizing there are little girls and boys like that all around the world, and us helping to address economic and political grievances that can be exploited by extremists and empowering local communities, and us staying true to our values as a diverse and tolerant society, even when we're threatened, especially when we're threatened. There will be a military component to this. There, there, there are, are savage cruelties going on out there that have to be stopped. ISIL is killing Muslims at a rate that, that is, is many multiples, uh, the rate that they're killing non-Muslims. Everybody has a stake in stopping them, and there will be uh, an, an element of, of us just stopping them in their tracks with force. But to eliminate the, the soil out of which they grew, to make sure that we are giving a brighter future to everyone and a lasting sense of security, then we're going to have to make it clear to all of our children, including that little girl in fifth grade, that you have a place. You have a place here in America. You have a place in those countries where you live. You have a future. Ultimately, those are the antidotes to violent extremism. And that's work that we're going to have to do together. It will take time. This is a generational challenge. But after 238 years, uh, it should be obvious, uh, America's overcome much bigger challenges. And we'll overcome the ones that we face today. We will stay united and committed to the ideals that have shaped us for more than two centuries, including the opportunity and justice and dignity of every single human being. Thank you very much, everybody.